there's a great study looking at college students and on the elevator ride up to where the study was to happen, the study coordinator who met them in the lobby needed to write something on a clipboard. So they asked the student to hold the cup of coffee. When they got off the elevator, they didn't even think the study had started. And then they watched a pre-recorded videotape of somebody being interviewed and they had to rate them. And the people who held the hot cup of coffee insistently rated the person they were watching as more positive. They were more interested, they were more generous in their assessment. <laughs>
fantastic thoughts about what should be done for somebody. Mm. And then I realized, oh, but I haven't actually seen who this person is. And that felt kind of abstract. And then as I also started working with more holistic and integrative principles, realizing that there was a broader way to, to probably support someone in what they were going through, which would be different than prescribing five different allopathic methods. <laughs> yeah. Um, which, which could be things very simply like having trouble falling asleep, bad menstrual cramps, asthma. Reflux. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> and sort of going, oh, um, not going to sleep. That's a kind of a cramp where you can't let go of the day's impressions. And hmm. a menstrual cramp is a, is a cramp um, being able or not being able to so easily let go of um, products that aren't needed still. And then asthma is kind of a respiratory cramp. Hmm. And this, this little bit of a constitutional picture was fascinating for me because I thought, oh, we're so used to seeing the little single parts that we address each one of those independently. And we do it pretty abstractly without seeing who a, a person really is. So for me, when I, I kind of got to that point, it, it made me say, I just need to do something that really feels honest and yeah, yeah. Um, nourishes me as well. So I've been doing anthroposophic medicine and a, a very humble private practice for about the last 20 years, but have been involved in training programs for physicians and other kinds of healthcare practitioners in anthroposophic medicine, um, directing programs for the last seven or eight years, and been involved in teaching for most of those 20 years of practice. So it's it's always nice to see where people are coming from, because an interesting thing is sometimes you go through an idea and somebody says, oh, that just makes sense because that's something that I've been thinking about or experiencing mm. for a long time. And I just didn't quite have the vocabulary for it. Yeah. What's up, everybody? It's Nathan, the host of your favorite podcast, the only OBGYN podcast that matters, the Holistic OBGYN podcast. These podcasts of this quality are very, very hard to continue to produce without listener support. So here's three things that you can do right now. Number one, if you like these episodes, if you like the show, share it with people you love. They're probably going to like it too. The second is to support our sponsors. I've aligned myself with brands that make the best, highest quality products out there, all pertaining to fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, parenting, you name it. Support them, let them know that you're paying attention. And then third, which is relevant to why I'm speaking to you right now, is that I want you to take a moment and click like just below the episode. Just click like, let the Googleverse and the interwebs know that you're listening, that you're paying attention to the Holistic Obituary podcast. Believe it or not, this really, really, really matters. So it's so important that I'm just going to take a brief pause right now. I'm going to let you go and click that like button. So just don't mind me. I'm just going to, going to wait. All right. You've done it. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think I've said enough. Let's get back to my conversation. Yeah. Before we started recording, I was, I was, I brought up some of the early chapters in a, um, a very, I think, accessible training manual for anybody who's interested in this topic. It's called Foundations of Anthroposophical Medicine. Um, it's edited by two um, German uh, authors, Goose van der Beer. It sounds actually Dutch. Uh, they're, they are, they're actually Dutch. They're it's, both Dutch. Okay. By, the, by Dutch uh, training program. Yeah. There we go. Um, so, uh, and, and one thing I, I wanted to sort of remind people, because we're going to get we're getting the going to get in the weeds in this conversation, is that if you're an allopathic doctor, and let's say uh, a lot of people have read Victoria Sweet's book Fast Medicine, or no, it's called Slow Medicine, and she describes in that book the fast medicine approach that we all, as allopathic doctors, learned, um, which is still practiced in many you know hospitalist sort of routine daily lives, which is you go into the hospital at six thirty seven, you've got your big cup of coffee. The nurses bring you all of the lab reports, all of the imaging, or you bring it up on your electronic health record. The nurses give you a report. You've now rounded on maybe 12 patients, and then you've, you've come up with a, an assessment and plan just from that objective data. And then you might have five minutes in the room because you've got so many work demands. This fast medicine seems efficient, but then it misses out on the experience between you as the, the healer, the practitioner, 
and the person seeking help. And so if through that lens, if we were to improve upon the allopathic model, which so many people, as you mentioned, are becoming somewhat cynical about because we don't see many improvements despite throwing more and more money into this fast medicine model. Could we improve upon allopathic medicine um, by including some of the principles of anthroposophic medicine? And when you read a book, like one of these introductory texts, you realize that, and I'll actually read a line here, it is not a matter of one thing replacing something else, but of something more inclusive absorbing something less inclusive. So when we are talking about some of these kind of, they seem perhaps uh, radical or, or um, woo-woo or whatever. I mean, people sure. use all sorts of words. Anthroposophic medicine is very, uh, sort of admittedly, is saying, hey, we're inclusive of all the other practices. This is a more unified model to help us you know, orchestrate all of these different modalities, which have done a lot of good. It's not meant to replace it or to say that allopathic medicine is wrong or that this is more validated or anything. This is really a matter of what are we lacking from the experience between the healer and the, the healee. <laughs> uh -huh. And so um, I actually, that's, that was very validating for me to start reading these texts, you know, under the, you know, the, the direction of you and your other faculty uh, at PAM, which is the Physicians Association of Anthroposophic Medicine, if I recall. Uh -huh. um, it's, a, it's a tongue twister. Um, because, you know, like many other people, we get through all of this training, we look back and we're like, gosh, that really, just like you, you said, it doesn't, it didn't really, it's not really serving me. I don't really seem to be doing much to help my patients. I'm just adding more medicines or recommending more imaging or doing more surgery. This perhaps provides a, a deeper toolkit, so to speak, and can be very validating for those who feel like something's missing here. This isn't really what I signed up for. So I wanted to start by just acknowledging and and, and 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 reminding everybody that this may be confronting, but this can also be very validating if you can just approach the conversation with an open heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Adam, anthroposophical medicine, it's a tongue twister. It, it stems out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, who was a um, 19th into the 20th century philosopher scientist. Um, a, a, a Christian mystic is another term that's been applied to him. And when you read the breadth of his work, it's hard to pick little pieces out and apply those practically. But the body of work of anthroposophic medicine came out of his work and in conjunction with Ida Wegman. If I have any part of that history wrong, please correct me. Sure. <laughs> what would you um, tell somebody? You're in an elevator. You know, hey, I practice anthroposophic medicine. What would you talk to them about? And um, yeah, how would you describe that to them? Right. Well, I think we could say that it is an, it's an integrative medical system. It is patient focused. It's multidisciplinary. Those are all words that can be used for a lot of things, but yeah. all of those are true. Mm -hmm. um, it also includes a lot of natural therapies and natural medicines, which are herbal, which are mineral, which are potentized. But there's a there's a broad breadth, broad breadth of natural medicines and really as a very special appreciation of the natural world mm -hmm. and how the human being relates to the natural world. Yeah. We're actually connected with this world around us. And then I would say the most core aspect is really trying to build a picture of the whole human being. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking how big that picture is, that, that varies from different traditional healing methods, but for almost all of them, there's really this, this whole bridging from very physical, testable, measurable aspects to what we could say are more functional biochemical aspects to emotional and social aspects to really developmental um, moral, and I will say deeply spiritual aspects. Mm. So let me pause and, you there, uh, because you used the word holistic before, and a lot mm -hmm. of people associate holistic with natural. That's a part of holistic, but when we, t when we think of the original, the root, holism, we're talking about the, you know, the, the, the whole person mm -hmm. is not relevant without each of its indiv individual constituent parts, and likewise for each of those parts. It means nothing outside of the whole orga organism. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, anyways. And that's, I think, what Rudolf Steiner, his fourfold sort of 
um, understanding of the human experience, the human being, really does kind of fold into this definition of holism very naturally. So um, since I have holistic in my practice name, a lot of people just think it sure. means natural, but it actually means far more than that. So sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to insert that because uh, the word holistic has become so such a buzzword, but continue. <laughs> we're still on the elevator. Yeah. We, we're on the 10th of elevator. 20 floors. <laughs> well, and, and I guess holistic sometimes means alternative, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or it's easy to think of it that way. But this is something that's actually totally different than yeah. a modern medical approach. Right. And what is even more of a mouthful is that originally anthroposophic medicine was described as it should truly be called anthroposophically extended medicine. Mm. So the the wish, the goal really, is that you need to have completed a conventional medical training. You need to have gone through all of that. You need to understand how the body works. You need to understand anatomy. You need to understand um, sick patients and and really that this is not a rejection in any way but this is an elaboration of of that learning and of mm. all of that science um and yeah i think the holistic picture that when you get up into the emotional realm that's not so hard although we tend as a as a medical culture just generally to kind of separate things into their physical illnesses and there are emotional psychiatric illnesses. Right. And they are, they are two pretty different realms. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. sometimes you can get bounced back and forth because somebody will say, well, this is not a physical problem. You need to go talk to so-and-so. And they will say, well, I don't think that this is in my domain. I really think you need to go and get some testing done. That's so right. we're not so good at bridges. Yeah. But, but fields like um, psychoneuroimmunology are really interesting. Mm. Um, study about sense of coherence and resilience is really interesting to say, how do these bridges go back and forth between what we experience in a conscious way, emotionally, spiritually, and how does that affect our immune system, our digestive system, um, processes of healing. So, so there's a lot of bridging is an essential part of anthroposophic medicine. But I would say an additional piece that's really important is trying to recognize that each person is really a unique spiritual being. Hmm. And that that individuality is there all through a person's lifetime with really a picture of that aspect, that sort of spiritual kernel being there coming into a body and that aspect continuing after death. Yeah. I'll just say that can make a big difference in terms of sometimes we look at physical illness and say, oh, this is severe, or this is greatly greatly limiting, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, or debilitating, or um, that's something that's not working perfectly, and that's really looking on the physical level. But I think within anthroposophic medicine, there's the goal to really look behind that and say, well, who is the individuality who's experiencing this process, and how, how do we not lose sight of them? Yeah, absolutely. You know, in in this textbook that I just brought up, there was a a whole chapter really on the his. It's a brief history of biomedical thought, and it talks a lot of, about throughout the ages, the past several centuries, before we had all the fancy imaging and whatnot. Some of the leading thinkers, philosophers of the time, namely Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, uh-huh. gave us this impression that our senses were easily confused, and so we need to take senses out of the out of the equation. You know, um, Francis Bacon. That was like his whole his whole shtick. And then, of course, of course, Rene Descartes, I think, was probably the linchpin in what we now consider modern medicine in the sense that if it's measurable, then it must be important. In other words, everything can be reduced to uh, the axioms of mathematics, which in some regard, that's actually helpful. 
-hmm. but do we miss out on the experience of the person, which is a dynamic experience? It's not a an, a static thing like we would expect to see chopping off a piece of tissue and looking at it under a microscope. There is a a dynamic process unfolding in front of our eyes, and if we if we um, are not using every one of our senses, or even our extrasensory senses, which we'll get into, because mm -hmm. that was sort of Rudolf Steiner's contribution, uh, gr you know, growing on this, uh, extending this conversation further. Mm -hmm. um, what could we learn more about ourselves and this person in our role right now, at this moment in time, considering that we're we're perpetually in a moving stream, and and you're never stepping in the same spot twice. You're always in a separate part of the river, so to speak. So uh, so we've gotten all the way here, and anthroposophic medicine was introduced in the early 20th century, early to mid 20th century. Yeah. Um, given just what we've said already, how did this, this approach change your practice? I mean, you went through the allopathic model. How did you start incorporating some of these basic principles, or had you already been, and like you, or like me, you kind of felt like a validation as to how you were already doing things? Well, it was definitely a process of evolution. There, there were certain pieces that just felt, oh, good, I feel more at home with that. The way it has changed things, I mean, I can say in some very practical ways, one is that I, it's asked, it's forced, it's encouraged me to listen in a different way. Mm -hmm. So my review of systems has shifted. I would say on a daily basis, I really try, try and think about how can someone be involved in their own healing process and what's important to them. Because if I'm just looking at physical chemical measures of their physiology, sometimes they're right on board, but sometimes they're really not. Mm. And, and they're actually feeling like they're not being seen at all. They're, they're just being told what to do based on an analysis of them, but it's not really them. So building some connection and, and really trying to see what is their goal. And, um, you know, at some point I remember hearing the statistic that 50% of prescriptions are never filled. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> uh, which, which is eternally kind of... Uh, fascinating and a, a little bit of a forehead slapping in terms of we can feel like we're doing a huge amount but if people aren't really invested in the process then we're kind of we're kind of spinning wheels but i don't know how much we're helping them change yeah um and then i guess where people are at different stages i really look at differently and i can just give a quick example of there are some predictable, predictable biographical rhythms. One of the most pronounced ones is that about every seven years, we go through sort of a reorientation, which I want to say comes more from a place of what is my intention in life? Um, and what am I going to do with myself for the next seven years? Hmm. And on the one hand, that looks like a crisis. Because a lot of people have anxiety symptoms or sometimes depression symptoms. But really what they're trying to do is make an inventory of what they're involved with and see what are the big priorities for me right now. Mm. And once I learned about those rhythms and started watching for them a little bit, so it's, it's between age 6 and 7, age 13, 14, age 20, 21. These the seven-year epics. Yeah. These seven-year epics. Yes. I mean, last week I saw two people in a row. One was 34 to 35 and the other was 41 to 42. And it would have been easy to say, oh, this, this person is having really an emotional breakdown. But by describing a process of saying, sometimes we need to loosen and reevaluate in order to find what's the appropriate next step. They were so happy. <laughs> um, because dissolution is is not really a part of most medical approaches to say sometimes we just got to let things go and have it be a little confusing or messy, but that's because we're taking a growth step. Yeah, 
Yeah. That, that's huge. Um, just a part of growing up, so to speak, and, or growing older for that matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, or there's another one when children are about nine, that they really start to become aware of themselves as unique individuals. And it's um, really classic that they start being fearful. They're worried about robbers. They're worried about tsunamis. They're worried about car accidents because they suddenly feel that they are really their own person in the world. Mm, that personal responsibility piece starts to really sink in. Yeah, and, and they feel that they're separate from their parents and their teachers. Mm. Um, so some of those aspects have just been huge. And then another big part of the way my practice changed was really trying to understand about natural medicines and the kinds of correlations to say, oh, there's a certain process that happens in our own body and there are certain processes that you see manifest in the natural world and they can work in a good way together. So I, I would say the biggest part of changing practice is just opening to new tools mm. and really listening and also trying to see what is somebody really needing and wanting in the process? I just spent a week with you and uh, the whole American crew in uh, Chestnut Ridge for training week, which is something yep. that any any U.S. physician, um, do you take residence as well if a person's in residency? Absolutely. Medical students. Dental medical doctors. I mean, there was nurse practitioners. It was a lot of people from a lot of backgrounds. That was probably the most beautiful part about the week. And it was an intensive week of training um, in a, at a beautiful center adjacent to a, uh, um, a Eurythmy center, which we won't get into here, but that's one of the modalities, the healing modalities okay. within anthroposophic medicine. Um, there was a, a Steiner, um, a Waldorf school. They had a, a little biodynamic garden. And before I ask you about the fourfold path that was really kind of new to me that week, I mean, I'd heard about it, but I didn't really get it. So we'll get into that. But sure. I also wanted to comment a, a little observation that I remember coming home with telling my wife, she was like, well, how was it? Did you learn anything new? And I mean, I'm always doing something new. I'm always, I've got so many books. And uh, I was like, you know, for the first time ever, I think I spent more time studying a plant than I spent studying a human. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but it was it was equally valuable. Can you be briefly, maybe, um, as a segue into the fourfold uh, model of the human being? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the role of plant study and perhaps even some of Steiner's uh, um, inspiration from the work of of Goethe? Absolutely. So, uh, um, plant study is included as a regular part of the medical training. Now, if you studied every plant in depth, that, that could take years, although that's a nice goal because it's pretty interesting once you've spent some time studying a plant that you have a different relationship to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I could just describe that observation process, which is, it relates a little bit to fast medicine. Mm. So usually and at least I'll say this personally, if you have some relationship to plants, but it's not hugely developed, you might look at a plant and go, oh, that's a sunflower. Ding, <laughs> I know sunflowers. Great, oh, that's delicious seeds, big yellow whatever, like yep. my grandma used to have them. Yeah, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, have a, you have a personal relationship with it, and that requires no study. <laughs> you, you've got a personal relationship and you know that, oh yeah, there's sunflower oil and the toasted seeds are good and they can grow really tall. Yeah. But sometimes our observation really stops at that point. Or we might see a different kind of plant and go, oh, that's unusual. I wonder what that is. I've never seen that before. And we might investigate further or we might just say, this is my usual level of engagement, and I know it or I don't, and then I move on. And really a fascinating part of the plant study, especially doing it in a, in a group, is looking and trying to describe what you see without immediately putting it in context. Hmm. And if we talked about a sunflower, 
you might or might not notice that the seeds that are in the center of the flower are in a spiral pattern. Or you might notice the flower so beautifully that you forget to even look and see what the leaves are like. Or you might look at the leaves but not the stem. And you might have no idea about what the roots of the sunflower look like. So there's this first this process of really trying to say, what are the details that I see specifically? And going around and, and sharing those in very objective ways. There is a yellow, um, delicate structure that goes off the end of the round part of the plant, which is a, a kind of a very specific way of saying there's a yellow petal on a sunflower. Yeah. But it makes you look differently. <laughs> um, and then there are steps about trying to think of this plant, how it grows, what it will look like next month, what did it look like the month before, which is really getting into a time element, thinking about vitality, thinking about processes of growth. And then as you go through these steps, you start to get an impression what might be the personality of this flower? Uh, if it was a movie star, what would it be like? Or if it was mm. an artist? Or because there's there's really a wholeness. We can say there's a beingness about a sunflower. We like sunflowers for a specific reason. And what's fascinating with many healing plants is that this actually works best if you know nothing about the plant is that by going through this process at the end, you start to have a feeling for what is the activity of this plant. And very often, it correlates just incredibly with traditional therapeutic uses of the plant. Mm -hmm. You can come to know what something can be helpful for by encountering it and really learning it and loving it and um, engaging and those things are often confirmed through a biochemical analysis. You can find what are the active components. Um, but it's this much deeper relationship to it that actually, I think it's more alive than a lot of what we do in sure. medical training and, and in sometimes in even patient encounters is, is yeah. really this, this kind of attention. I think if we approach this type of um, conversation from a very uh, limited allopath or let, let's say biochemical sort of lens, mm -hmm. um, you end up, you know, being very uh, confronted by the idea that people living way long ago, like we're mm -hmm. talking ancient Sumer, you know, earliest written human history, that people were still finding therapeutic uses. People were like, how could they possibly have known what that did? Or let's look at many indigenous, you know, First Nations uh, uh, groups within the United States who are still, they're still carrying on traditions, perhaps, of using various herbs or preparations or whatever in order to heal, gently heal uh, various pathologies. What you're, what you're really referring to is the, the sort of signature, this archetype of what this thing means in nature. Yes. And how could that... Uh, given our experience or, or even just our observations, how might that play in to our healing process or our diagnosis and management of, of disease? I don't think we, you know, it's sort of like saying breastfeeding is good. They, the docs at Harvard said it was good. They did an analysis. Well, do we really need that to know that this works? Perhaps it helps confirm what we've mm -hmm. found. But, but, you know, in Western medicine, I think we kind of start there. We like, we have to prove it and then we can, start to use it versus, hey, if it's useful, why don't we try to figure out why it's so useful? It's a bit of a paradigm shift, kind of a 180 degree turn in some regards. I don't think that they're exclusive to one another or that they should be divorced from one another, but it is a very, very different approach. And I will tell you, for your listeners, that when Adam was guiding us through this, uh, this ex experience, it wasn't until maybe day five or six that we actually learned what the the type of plant was that we were looking at. And, and we were also there in the early spring before this plant had really generated any new growth. Right. So we've seen how it has developed over time. And the, and, and I will say as a, as a student of this, 
that it was almost like doing a physical exam for the very first time in my life, not knowing what pitting edema was. All it was was a a matter of observation. You're going to touch it. Is it cold? Is it warm? Is the skin um, discolored? Does the skin look healthy? Is there hair growing on the skin? Are there ulcers on the skin? Is the skin pitting? Meaning, <laughs> there I go with it, with the, uh, you know, does the skin, when I press my finger into the skin, does it rebound quickly? Or does it fill with blood really quickly? Or does it stay depressed? I'm not doing a good job of this based on how we did it for the plant. But the point being that when we all started this practice, we actually started with plant study. Mm -hmm. And then we developed our notions of what pitting edema means when the skin stays impressed. And we just jump to conclusions that they have some sort of you know renal insufficiency or their hearts in a state a degree of failure, and we jump to that as opposed to actually just spending time observing. To the credit of most doctors, you may not have the time to do all of that whenever you know administrators and whatnot are pressing you to see more people. But there is something to be said for just being with the tissue or the the fingers or the joints or with a stethoscope or with your ear on somebody's chest and just being with it and just allowing the, the observations to unfold without bringing our experience and our, our judgment, I believe is the word that is used in a lot of these texts, but yep. to the conversation. Yeah, I think, well, one aspect is I think we sense each other on a lot of different levels. I think we have a lot of senses. Um, doing patient consultations through telehealth. It's an interesting phenomenon. It can be really helpful. It also is limited. Yeah. I see, I work with lots of children. Seeing how a child moves, how they talk, how they engage with you. That tells you a lot about them. Yeah. Aspects of warmth, of physical warmth, of social warmth, of interest warmth. Uh, all of those things I think we sense very much. I do feel that we get input on this bigger level very quickly when you see somebody and your doctor self says, sick, not sick. Right. Because there are times that you look at somebody and you just say, ooh, this is not good. Yeah. Something's up here. Something's up. And maybe they're not even complaining of something yet so much, or it's pretty vague, but you say, ugh, this mm. makes me concerned. Mm -hmm. And other times somebody's complaining, but you have the feeling, actually, this is, there's time. We can work on this. It's not an acute emergency. Um, I, I think one aspect of this larger observation also is trying to sense, and I'll use the example of temperature. If somebody's temperature is elevated, is it because they are at the beginning of an illness or is it because they're at the end of an illness? Mm. Or the middle. Let's talk about fever because we were going to get into that anyways. But uh, yeah. this is one of your really, really. I'm not going to say you're an expert. I don't. I don't think you would ever describe yourself as an expert. But you're very, oh, very no, thoughtful. I'm, I'm curious. I'm you're curious very curious. About... Yeah. <laughs> and, and I I like um, spending time on PubMed doing different kinds of searches around warmth and fever. Mm -hmm. Because what's fascinating is that you can find some really exciting studies and insights that sort of show this whole bridging activity that are not done by somebody in a specific integrative or holistic or complementary medical stream. These are just regular observations. Yeah. Um, and so I, I like to share and teach about this a little bit, but one of the things that blew me away, this was... 2020 was the study that showed that actually our assumption that normal body temperature is 98.6, which is, I don't know how many things are written in stone, but, but that's a pretty solid one. <laughs> 120 um, over 80 and 98.6. That's, right. uh, that's a healthy that's, person. <laughs> that's what you want. Um, is... 
that this this study looking at the last 150 years since the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. and that starting with Civil War veteran cohorts, to M. Haynes study in the 1970s, to more recent, I think it's a Stanford group that is studying, um, showing that average body temperature has been dropping. And probably an average human body temperature right now is around 97.9 or 98. And that just is amazing that, that we go by this as this is the absolute written in stone truth. And yet we're off by six tenths, seven tenths of a degree. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a pretty big uh it's a pretty big difference. Yeah. I, I will add, you know, over the years of COVID, when I was still working in the hospital system, um, mm -hmm. which was short lived, it was about six months during COVID that I was still in a hospital every single day going in. And of course they they scan your head every right. day. And I also ride a motorcycle or I bike. And um you have a big thick helmet on your head. So I would take it off and be sweaty and warm and I would still clock in at sometimes below 96. Like I just had a, uh, they were in, in one time they actually called, they thought I was maybe septic. And I was like, I'm definitely not septic guys. Right. <laughs> but uh, when we have these strict parameters, they, they got concerned. And of course I'm healthy as can be, but I was sure. like 95.8 one day. And they were like, I don't think you should come into work. And I was like, I promise you I'm okay, but do whatever you got to do. And right. I don't know if we've actually had a universal screening like that maybe ever, you know, I mean, perhaps maybe since that original, you know, work was done, but we have all this data. I wonder if we did look at all that COVID data of swabbing people at CVS and the library and whatever, you know, for a while, everybody was doing it. And um, I wonder if we took that and got some averages, I wonder what we would see. It would probably be very, very uh, much more wide ranging than 98.6. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, That's maybe a study you can do, Dr. Blanning. Well, I'd, I know in the, <laughs> there's a UK study that they they tried to establish what's probably a normal body temperature now. Yeah. And, and it was around that 97.9. Um, I mean, in looking at these studies, I, I also learned, which was never mentioned to me in medical school, that there's such broad variation in body temperature over the course of 24 hours. Mm. Yeah, of course. Um, that... Again, it's about three quarters of a degree that goes up and down just based on the time of day. Um, in clinical practice, I learned that some, and, and I think also from my, my family, um, that you know a child has a fever and they seem cool in the morning and you think everything's good and then it's a late afternoon or evening and their body temperature goes up. Bam, they're, the they're hot. Returns, yeah. And you say, <laughs> oh no, I thought they were better and now they're sick again. But actually that can very naturally be part of this um, daily alternation in temperature. Hmm. And so if we take this alternation in temperature and then we think about fever, then there's very classically defined the beginning of a fever when the body temperature is trying to go up. Hmm. And that's maintained for a certain number of days. It's all regulated by the thermoregulation centers of our brain. A temperature is really dangerous. A high temperature is dangerous if we are in an environment where we can't regulate our body temperature. So if you're sitting in a sauna yeah. and you have a fever, that's not good. Mm. But if you can sweat and you can take covers off and on, it really doesn't seem to be an automatic temperature which gets too dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I heard this, I, I also thought, well, that's not true because... Another thing written in stone is that a fever is dangerous and you shouldn't let it get to a certain level or you're going to cause brain damage. Yeah. Um, but there's a report from the American Academy of Pediatrics looking at vast literature on fever, which does not give a cutoff temperature and actually says fever phobia gets in the way of important immune aspects of elevated temperature in terms of decreasing viral replication, um, activity against bacteria, that this sort of knee-jerk suppression of fever, we're getting in our way a little bit. Hmm. And if you look at the summary of, of this position paper from the American Academy of Pediatrics, this recommendation paper, they say it's important 
to try to address discomfort during fever. And so Tylenol and ibuprofen have a role in that aspect. They should not be used just to decrease the temperature. Hmm. And this goes for all for children and adults. Well, this is the pediatric academy. Pediatric, yeah, right. Okay. So um, I think you see fever most commonly in children and teens. Um, you know, if you have an elderly person who has a very high fever, you probably have to look at that a little bit more carefully. Mm -hmm. um, but the principle of saying, oh, we don't need to automatically stop it. And then we can take another step and say, this person looks sick. They're grumpy, they're pale, they're chilled. And those are all the, the qualities, the symptoms that come right at the beginning of a fever mm -hmm. and say, well, the body is going to increase warmth until it reaches its determined core body temperature. So actually, the best thing we can do is put a hat on them, give them some hot tea and a hot water bottle by their feet. Warm them up. Warm them up, because if the body is trying to warm them up, let's help the body do that task. It's, it's interesting because when, when, as an adult, you know, let's say you get COVID, right? Or any, of, mm -hmm. any viral illness, we've all been through that. You get chills and it makes you want to actually bundle up, which right. is qu quite interesting, right? So it's almost like we have this other mechanism that seems counterintuitive. If I'm, if I'm getting hot and we're trying to bring the fever down, why would I be covering myself with blankets and everything else? But that's exactly what we do almost re reflexively, um, which is kind of interesting, uh, and, and again, that goes back to our observation of what is the role of a fever? What is, what is actually, uh, are we seeing the symptom or are we actually seeing the mechanism of healing? Uh, and that's, that's, that's confronting in a protocolized system. But what you're saying is that we need to get that temperature is going to go up to some point. Let's say it's 101. The body's trying to get up there and it's trying to get up there quickly. If we drop it down with an antipyretic, namely acetaminophen and ibuprofen are probably the two most common in the United States, we may actually inhibit whatever this process is um, by not permitting the body to raise itself up through its internal thermostat to a higher than normal baseline body temperature. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay. And, and there are some interesting studies. There's one done in a variety of anthroposophic clinics where, where really this observation about fever, about trying to accompany the fever in its course and not suppress it unless, or I would say lower it, but, but it is a kind of suppression. Yeah. Um, not interfering with that process unless somebody is really uncomfortable. And the, the study looked at ear aches or ear infections and upper respiratory infections. And what's fascinating is that when you compare this to standard care, the number of days that patients need to first improvement in symptoms is actually faster with anthroposophic treatment than conventional treatment. And if you look at antibiotic prescription rates, they are a fraction. Like instead of 70% of patients getting antibiotics for an ear infection, um, it's like 5%. It's not wow. nothing, but it's, it's a fraction. Versus maybe, I don't know, 80%. I mean, there's probably some populations where, or some clinics where every single child is going to be getting antibiotics. So if we could reduce that, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. one big theme that, that keeps coming up is antibiotic resistance. Sure. Um, cause at some point, we're, or in definite different clinical areas, we're kind of running out of some options. And so I think that that can nudge us in this direction, but also just trying to take this little bit broader view and say, there is an aspect of the human body, which works in time, which works with rhythms, which is closely connected to vitality. And how do we study that and understand it as a friend? It's really about growth and regeneration. Um, and in lots of healing traditions, there's this understanding of the importance of vitality and, and growth forces. Um, and I, I really think it's, 
It's about this broader physiologic view. What do you think happens when, you know, <clears throat> I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of feeding you softballs because you are you are so versed in this. But when an OBGYN talks about pediatrics and mm -hmm. fevers, and I am a dad, I've got two little girls. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I I oftentimes tell people, you know, when my little girls get a fever, let's look at Penny, the two and a half year old. She gets these fevers and then wakes up the next day and she has more language. She's got more uh, proprioceptive skills. She's a little bit more. I don't know. She's a little more daring in her balancing as she's going up the stairs or whatever. You know, it uh -huh. seems like something's happening. What is your sort of impression as to why sometimes these fevers are happening without necessarily some sort of infectious impulse for the immune system to go haywire? Yeah. Well, we can connect it on a couple of levels. Probably the core one being that this aspect I spoke of in terms of our core spiritual individuality really works through warmth. Mm. I'll, I'll mention a couple studies. So you're feeding me softballs so I can geek out on <laughs> <laughs> all the variations of warmth. Um, it's one thing to geek out on. A lot of people have, you know, their sports things. They've got their video games. Adam Blanning sits at I, home and I geeks know. out on fever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's fascinating when you were working with observations and ideas, and then you see it validated. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, in terms of warmth in the outside world, I will say there's a great study looking at college students who were going to evaluate somebody and on the elevator ride up to where the study was to happen, the study coordinator who met them in the lobby needed to tie their shoe and the study coordinator was always holding a cup of coffee. Um, oh, I'm sorry, they didn't not tie their shoe, but they needed to write something on a clipboard. So they asked the student to hold the cup of coffee and the whole study was a randomization of whether the coffee was hot or iced. When they got off the elevator, they didn't even think the study had started. And then they watched a pre recorded videotape of somebody being interviewed and they had to rate them on different personality scales. And the people who held the hot cup of coffee consistently rated the person they were watching as more positive. Hmm. They were more interested. They were more generous in their assessment. They did a second part of the study where college students were asked to assess either a cold therapeutic pad or a hot therapeutic pad. And then at the end, they said, thank you so much for your participation. Um, as a thank you, we can offer you a drink now, or we can give you this coupon to go later with a friend and get something together. The people who held the hot pads tended to choose the gift card to go later with someone else and share the experience. People who held the cold pads tended to choose the reward for themselves in the moment. So warmth Amazing. influences how we approach the world. Yeah. And I would say for children who have a strong fever and take a developmental step, I think they are warming into the world. <laughs> I think they, they become more interested, yeah, um, more engaged. <clears throat> There's another study that looks at high fever or strong fever in children who have um, different levels of autism spectrum. And they found that during a high fever, different behaviors in terms of restlessness, in terms of stereotypy, like repeated hand movements, uh, arm flapping, or set phrases that were repeated over and over. There are four different qualities they looked at, and I don't know that I can pull them up from memory this moment, but they all improved during fever. This is per parent ratings. Then the parents rated it again when the fever was done, and then they rated it again seven days later. And the improvement for these children lasted. It wasn't just during the fever. So I would say for someone who is working very hard 
to find good orientation and good communication through their body. But this really strong warmth experience helps them shift and settle in some way so that they're really more in themselves. Um, hmm. So those are, those are some little studies. What, what I think is fascinating is I read some commentaries on that article about uh, fever and autism, and people said, well, probably as part of the inflammatory cascade, there is something that is released, and if we could identify that specific, specific aspect, we can synthesize it, and then we can give it as a, a medication to autistic children to stimulate their brains to work in a different way. Hmm. And, and that might be true, but I think it's missing this bigger picture of how warmth works on a physical level, on a social level, on a meaning level, and really this kind of aspect of spiritual invitation that comes through a strong warmth experience as well. We, we just love to go to those little, little details. Yeah, yeah. Well, even the nature of how science is practiced, I'm using the, the, the big word science, you know, people say it's not, that's not backed by science or whatever. Well, in order for something to be studied so precisely, we have to lose every variable that might be interfering with our observation of the cause and effect between an intervention and whatever the outcome is. So the better you know, researched a concept is, a concept maybe not the right word, but a, an association is, mm -hmm. the less generalizable it tends to be because we get in the weeds because we want to eliminate all pot potential interference. Yeah. Um, there's all this noise, in other words, and we want to just find the signal. And sometimes that actually leads us down a path where we're, we're, we're again, we're, we're not practicing holistic, a holistic approach where we're, we're going down to this this granule size outcome without considering that there's a whole person with a whole story before and a whole story coming after. There's a dynamic process that gets missed whenever we try to do that. I, I think there's been a, a good amount of work trying to just reframe things a little bit to say, how do we look at science? What, what does that mean? Um, there are a variety of aspects where when somebody's choosing to take up a certain treatment, we could say that's the placebo effect, but it's it's also this aspect of what are they wanting? What, what are they seeking? And I don't know that we can always yeah. claim that um, when it's a randomized trial. I, I will say what is also interesting is there's some studies looking at treatment of chronic illness, usually over, I think, a four-year span, where it's things like low back pain um, and headache and um, a variety of a variety of chronic illnesses. And then they did kind of quality of life measures. And that you could see that people's physical symptoms improved, but so did other measures of health and mood and things like that. Hmm. Um, where, yes, it's nice if we change the back pain, but if we also change the back pain and people feel better overall, and it's sustained for a longer period of time, that, that actually has real meaning. Yeah. For yeah. the patients, it has real meaning for the whole health system. Um, economically, it, it makes a difference. Um, I'll just throw in, there's colleagues in Europe who are looking at fever in very specific ways. One is Dr. David Martin in Germany, who has um, something called Fever App, um, which has been endorsed by the German Pediatric Association. You can actually download it to your smartphone and it guides you through how to navigate a fever. And the insurance companies are interested in this because too many people go to the emergency room for a fever. Yeah, and of course. Really, it's um, not a big concern. But I, I also think when we hold this bigger perspective, 
um, and create some space to see how our own bodies are working with things, it can be empowering because people have more knowledge about what's going on with their body and they also can, can lean into the process. Real quickly, I mean, when when we do get above, like, I don't know, let's say a person, a, even a little kid gets to like the 103, 104, like, ooh, we're getting into that, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, a temperature that might start degrading our, our proteins. I don't know. I mean, sure. this sounds scary and febrile seizures come to mind. What is the the approach that you might take for gradually, just gently lowering the seizure just a little bit, whether it's for comfort or because you are thinking, mm, body's trying to go up but maybe we should cap this off at, at some points because it's starting sure. to get into that danger zone uh, danger zone so a nice treatment is actually to take a little bit of lemon juice and some water or if you don't have any lemons a little bit of apple cider vinegar and you put it in some water you might put a couple of tablespoons and then taking either some socks um, large socks or some washcloths or a really nice way is if you're willing to sacrifice some adult socks, cut the toe off and um, you put this in the lemon water, wring it out so that it's damp but not dripping anymore mm -hmm. and then slip it up over the person's calves and have them rest with that but under covers. You don't want them to catch a chill in this process. And it's pretty amazing. Um, it really helps move warmth down into the legs and then release it. And you can see somebody's temperature drop a couple of degrees in probably 15 or 20 minutes. Wow. It doesn't stop the whole process, but it moves the warmth. And I, I've done this with my own children where you say, is somebody really just uncomfortable or is there a, a danger? And when the temperature goes down, it gives you a window to see how are they. And if they totally perk up and they seem fine, then you know that, yes, they needed a break from the warmth. Yeah. Um, and if the temperature drops and they are still confused or lethargic or things like that, then, of course, you've got to do more assessment um, and get more medical attention. But that's a very simple way to work with the dynamics of warmth. and. A lot of the times I think you see that actually somebody's doing just fine and you can continue to let them working through this strong warmth process. Working through the warmth. I think that that's a really beautiful uh, summary of your sort of approach to fever is that there is some function to this. This is not a necessarily something that is going to be catastrophic. Um, you know, it, you, you mentioned menstrual cramps, and I what came to me when you said that was, uh, you know, in the process of giving birth, of course, the uterus is contracting very hard, but it's functional. Yes, there's an experience of pain because we associate that that cramping with pain, but there's actually also a function to this. This is actually a, a dynamic process whereby those contractions, which in the hypnobirthing and more natural birth community, they mm -hmm. lose contractions all, the, all all together, and they say surges. These are these are experiences of your baby being brought down and out into the into the world, and when you can reframe that, it actually makes it seem a lot less um, confronting or or scary, so to speak, right. uh, for many women. Um, and the same, I think, could be said for virtually everything, including fever, is to reframe our language around it a little bit. Um, let's help this person work through it versus let's battle it or let's. Um, Let's you know knock it out with these antipyretics or whatever. That there's a probably some reason the body is going through this. So let's help to encourage that and facilitate that as opposed to halting it and uh, wiping our brow. You know, close call. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Um, people actually get better faster. Yeah, when, I'm sure. When we when we can can reach in and understand the process. Um, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. We, we all have sort of different inclinations, too. Um, there are some children who get a fever and burn very strongly for 24 hours, and they're done. Hmm. And they may have a sibling who never really gets a fever, but is going to have that cold and nagging cough for two and a half weeks. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, huh. And you, it's not an absolute thing, but, but when you're looking for the gestures, they're, they're definitely there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it does make me think about our two and a half year old. She went through periods of these fevers where my wife was really afraid and teething, especially it's like, let's mm -hmm. bring the fever down. Well, it's, it's a hundred, hundred point five. It's barely a fever. And yes, she's a little bit uncomfortable, but is her body doing something? Is this fever not a an infection, but perhaps a part of the remodeling of the entire jaw <laughs> as a tooth is coming right. up through? And and so, I mean, I'm making it very. I'm I'm you know I'm not the I'm not over trying to overly confound that. I mean, but but even on simple terms, yeah, there's there maybe there's some function, which which you know I think is a nice segue into kind of taking a step back. And you've mentioned a lot of, of childhood. I know a lot of, of things can happen in a person's life in childhood. And through some biographical work, um, you might be able to pair up things that appear later in a later epic, these seven-year epics, um, sort of in a mirror to what happened in the earlier epics. But, you know, but without getting into the biographical work, I think what's important is maybe if you could, I, I want to be respectful of your time as well, but maybe you could just uh, describe what Steiner's fourfold model of the human being, um, sure. which can be applied to any living or non-living thing, really. Um, mm -hmm. Can you describe that real quickly? You bet. And um, Steiner elaborated on this, but a, a fourfold model has been there for a long time. The Greeks talked about it too, and the Romans, and we can talk about it in terms of four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. We could talk about it in terms of four humors, which I remember that being presented in medical school as, as really such a simplistic view of the human being, mm -hmm. which if we take it... Um, in a straightforward way and saying, yes, you need to be bled or you have too much black bile or things like that. That doesn't really make sense. It, yeah. it doesn't fit. Yeah. But it's easy it, to take Galen out of context. Uh, yes. You know, I obviously he didn't have, every, have everything right. In fact, he may have done some, some damage as to how we uh, now perceive of, you know, through our lens of biomedical thought contemporarily. But if you read that work and try to apply it to your, you know, modern uh, guidance tech, you know, textbook on physiology, it's going to sound mm -hmm. like wackadoo. But mm -hmm. there's probably more to it that we just don't really have context for. So, go ahead, continue. Yeah, I, I think in some ways it's really about four lenses mm -hmm. or, or four four interweaving aspects. Um, first is physical body. What can be measured? What can be X-rayed? What can be biopsied and fixed and seen under a microscope. Um, and this is really the substance of the body. And that's essential. Mm -hmm. We work with that all of the time. And knowing yeah. how that works is really important. But so things which can be easily quantifiably measured tend to fall into that category. And we tend to move to that category when we're doing testing and assessment in lots of different ways. Right, right. I think a second level is more this aspect of time, of how do we grow and change over time, a study of vitality, a study of growth, and that we really have regenerative forces in us a very striking example for me is the difference between seeing someone who is in a coma versus someone who has died. There's just, it's a different in vitality. It's different. You can, yeah. you can say something missing. <laughs> it has to do with gravity. It has to do with the fluid sinking. Yes, all true. But there's also an aspect of, of the vitality is just different. And we can also say it's the difference between a stone and a plant. Hmm. Stone's not going to change in time. It doesn't have its own vitality, but a plant is changing. It's growing. It will look different in the future than it did in the past. So the second aspect of time and growth forces is, is really a whole aspect of the human being. And in anthroposophic medicine, that's usually described as parts of the etheric forces. Um, 
Then a third aspect really has to do with emotion, with sensation, with particular types of ways that we sense things, that we feel things, um, specialized activities, where we can say the kidney is a very specific organ. It is working to filter fluid out and then absorb it back in. Hmm. And actually, it's not so much an excretion organ. It's a, it's a sensing organ that we release, and then we absorb 90% of it back. Hmm. It's not a very efficient technical model. <laughs> um, it's a lot of fluid movement there without a lot, a lot of output. It's a lot of fluid movement for just <laughs> choosing, you know, if, if you were looking for a book on your bookcase, you wouldn't take 10 books off and then put nine of them back. Um, not routinely, probably. Yeah. Um, or what is the difference between somebody who has high blood pressure, which is very much related to stress and anxiety, and they get pale and it's terrible white coat hypertension mm. versus somebody who is rounder and red and never feels whether their blood pressure is high and nothing phases them. Those are different types of blood Absolutely. pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And this is more in this sensation, uh, emotional, and, and then also particular gestures or archetypes of physiology. And in anthroposophic medicine, that's spoken about as astral forces. And then the, the third, or I'm sorry, the fourth aspect is, is really this spiritual aspect of who someone is as an individuality. The I. The I. Yeah, and the anthroposophic word for that is the eye, because mm. we not not the organ that we see with the eye, but the capital letter I, because that's a word that we can only use in reference to ourselves. Right. So we've got the solid, we've got mm -hmm. the the mineral body. I think is maybe a way to put it. Mm -hmm. Then we have the plant kingdom in our mm -hmm. in our, our classification system, but. Obviously, there's a spectrum there. That's where plants have an etheric force which separates it from the rock. It's just something mm -hmm. we intuitively get. But then, obviously, Labradors or cows are separate from the plants because they seem to have this feeling component. Plants are intelligent. They're thinking, sensing beings. But the feeling, uh, the um, uh, perhaps the emotional side of, of the experience, there's something different in a cow that you don't get with a plant and then the humans are are you have the ability to be aware of this entire sort of hierarchy so to speak it's not really a hierarchy but you know the word mm -hmm. i think serves mm -hmm. um yeah so this is the fourfold model go ahead if, you know, i'm sure you were going yeah, to tie we it all could together say, we could say substance growth awareness self awareness mm I love would that. be another way to describe it. That that step from plants to animals, we, we also see amazing kind of specialization and differentiation in animals. We can do incredible things. Yeah. Uh, dolphins swim as masters. Um, a beaver can cut down trees beautifully. Uh, a cow can chew cud and digest grass in a way that certainly no human being can do. And then as human beings, we're actually not so specialized. We're, we're not as good at swimming or is it cutting down trees or digesting as these other things. But we have many different capacities within us and this, this ability to be reflective about what we're doing and and intentional in a way that's that's beyond an instinctive capacity. Yeah. And right. And that's that spiritual aspect of not only what am I doing, but why am I doing it and what is unique for my path. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is, I think this is really the crux. Uh, and this is also, I think maybe the most confronting thing because, uh, because we're not used to thinking of these various, um, energetic bodies that kind of govern mm -hmm. over 
who we are and, and, and how we compare to the rest of our biological brethren around us. When people use the word soul, or when, when Steiner uses the words body, soul, spirit, mm-hmm. what is he referring to with soul and spirit? Because I think these words have also become kind of buzzy, like holistic, you know? Okay. What would Steiner say about the soul and spirit as it pertains to this fourfold model? Steiner would say that the body is really the physicality and this aspect of growth and changing physiology. Steiner describes the soul as being the aspect of us which relates more to emotion and sensation, to what he also describes as the astral body. And then he describes spirit as specifically being related to the eye, Mm. to this most independent kernel, this aspect inside of us. I have so many questions about that, but it's because I'm a student of this and I'm trying to go further, but I'm going to, I'm going to pause on that because we could get into, I mean, this is an evolving terrain, I'm sure for you as well, as you have more experience. Um, One thing I did want to bring up is that people often talk about the mind body connection. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the way there, but I read a really interesting quote from Steiner recently that said that the mind is the sensing organ consciousness is no mind is the sensing organ for thoughts and that and that consciousness is the synthesis of that the precepts and the in the concepts so what we're observing and what we're our sort of um um our synthesis of those ideas putting all of that together that is consciousness but that the mind and body alone wouldn't be enough do you have any reflections on that i just feel like this mind body piece is really really hot right now well i think it's really hot I think we, we have to be a little bit careful with it because it, it tends to separate things again. Right, right, I've, yeah. I've got my consciousness and I've got my body. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and I work on one or the other, but really the, these are flowing into each other all of the time. Yeah. Um, and we tend to think about mind as being the part of us which is consciously accessible through thought But even if we just look at our nervous system, we've got our got our our brain, which is much more related to this consciousness aspect. But then we've got a sympathetic nervous system, Mm. which is accessible to consciousness, but it's doing a lot of things on its own. And then we've got a parasympathetic nervous system, which is mostly unconscious. Mm. And you know, estimations that. If you look at the ganglion of the parasympathetic nervous system, there's as many nerves there as there are in the central nervous system. Right. Um, So I think that's just a beautiful picture of this bridging. And the parts that we can consciously feel, that's where we tend to put all of our eggs in the basket, but it's just a part. Yeah. In In the same way that, we could say only this, the parts of the human being that I can physically, chemically test are real and nothing else is real. That's a part, but it's not the whole reality. You can have somebody be very sick physically and finding tremendous meaning and importance in what they're doing. And you can have somebody be physically well and not be finding that purpose and connection and intention because we we tend to equate one with the other and there's they're they're different ends of this bridge um so it's so nice to be trying to understand that bridge so that we can see is this a moment where i really need to focus on physical testing and control this process, guide this process, or is this a time when I really just need to uh, respect and honor this person's experience? Yeah, I, you know, we this is <laughs> the study of esotericism in general tends to lead down these paths where it's you've got more questions than answers at the end of the at the end of that a particular conversation. Um, I remembered the quote, by the way, it was that thinking is the sense organ for concepts and ideas, which I think is a really fascinating 
uh, a tremendously difficult um, thing to acquire and then to kind of go forth with. But these little kernels, I think, really will help us, I think, bring forth a, a, a more comprehensive, integrative approach to healing. Um, so thank you for doing your best in answering some of these hard questions. I did have one final question because I think a lot of people are going to be wondering, when you said natural remedies earlier, and then you okay. also used the word pot potent potentized? Is that the potentized? Is that yeah, the word potentized. you use? Mm -hmm. We are talking about dilutional remedies. Mm -hmm. And um, some people immediately go to homeopathy. But mm -hmm. the, the, the approach to remedies within the lens of through the lens of anthroposophic medicine is quite different from traditional homeopathy. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe talk a little bit about... Um, I remember we had a great pharmacist. I can't remember his name at our training week. Uh, Albert Schmidley. Albert Schmidley. What a great guy. He did a, a really interesting rendition as to how some of these remedies, which are all plant-derived, mostly plant-derived, some of them also m just mineral-derived, um, from the sensing organs, the roots, the sort of flow structures. The, the uh, Oh, do I have that right? The roots are the sensing and then we have the the metabolic components which are our flowers and buds and then mm -hmm. we have this sort of this flow this this giant stem in a sunflower a very very tiny stem in your petunias um he broke that down as a means of trying to understand from a pharmacologic standpoint how these remedies are created can you can you maybe assuage some people's hesitations around a dilutional therapy um maybe through the lens of what albert was teaching us at, at uh, training, which, which by the way, was way over my head, but I was like, this guy might be a genius and I need to study this a little <laughs> harder. So I immediately went home and bought everything Goethe. Well, at least that was available, you know, for trade paperback from Goethe and his study of plants in order to better understand this. But anyways, um, this will be our final question, Adam. I appreciate your time today. You bet. You bet. Well, let's see. In, in terms of the, the preparation of the medicines, There is this, there's this process, this science, this patterning of saying, oh, again, there's a relationship between the human being and, the, and a plant in the natural world. And different parts of the plant work in a process way, in a gesture way, we could say in an energetic way, with different parts of the human being. So that's one aspect. And it's it's totally fascinating to say, oh, if I really want to work with the middle part of the human being, with the lungs especially, or maybe the heart and the circulation, then a plant, uh, a plant's leaves could be particularly helpful. Or if I want to work more with the metabolism and the digestion, using the flower or the fruit or the seed can be more helpful. So that, that's one aspect. I guess in terms of things which have been prepared in a potentized manner, which are diluted, the key aspect there, I think, is this is one of my favorite sentences in anthroposophic medicine, which comes from Rudolf Steiner, is that substance is a process come to rest. Mm, so say that, that one more time. A, a substance substance is a process come to rest okay so that's not so hard if we think about a mineral a stone because at some point it formed out of a dynamic process but that was a long time ago mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if we think about a plant maybe that's not so hard because we can say yeah a plant is very vital it's been growing over the season or if it's a perennial, it's been growing over multiple seasons. But I can see that any substance that I can take from a plant, it was in a dynamic growth process at some point. And so it's possible to understand how a process goes into substance. And then it's also possible to understand how something which has found a fixed form and substance can be slightly loosened to come back into a process state. Hmm. <laughs> to have some flexibility. Yeah. 
It relates a little bit maybe to when I spoke about biographical times that we dissolve a little and get disoriented. <laughs> So there right. are a lot of anthroposophic yeah. medicines where a substance is taken and then it is worked with in different ways. Sometimes it's diluted in water. Sometimes it is burned to an ash. Sometimes um, it goes through a kind of, of warming and almost a digestion process. And then often the substance is diluted to try and lift it back into this state where it is more flexible and and process oriented which if we're just thinking about the molecules that doesn't make sense but that's because we're that's just one end of a spectrum that's only looking at the substance and it's not able to encompass the process aspect yeah yeah what you mentioned earlier of all of these healing plants that have been used for thousands of years, and we say, well, how did people know how to use these things? Because there wasn't any kind of chemical analysis available at that time. They were understanding the process of the plant. And whether that was an intuitive feeling or whether that was something that was ex developed over time through experience or both, or what uh, who knows what other aspects, um, that's really where this dilutional aspect is, is very helpful. I, I had a fascinating conversation with someone in the last few weeks who actually works very strongly in the pharmacy and pharmacy research field and had brought a family member to see me for a chronic condition. And I could see he was really grappling with this. And he said, well, we're coming because we have family members who have been treated this way. And in their family, this problem has gone. Mm. And really, the most important evidence is what's the end result of the process. And I thought it was beautiful. He said this about three times during our session together, that trying to understand that there's something that can happen in terms of a living shift, um, a flexibility, a change, an enlivening that's working through a different dynamic. He could sense that it's possible, but he couldn't quite step out of a pharmacy mode. <laughs> but he wanted to go there in order to help this person and his family. And I, I think anthroposophic medicine has been working hard for a hundred years to really develop that pathway. Yeah. Well, as a, a means of kind of um, synthesizing everything we've talked about, I want to give you like a quick little case study. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, in the United States specifically, in most of the quote, Western or developed world, autoimmune conditions, they're kind of running rampant. And in my world, I've got thyroids, I've got fertility issues, I've got endometriosis, all these other things. And I've, we don't really have a great answer for it. So um, we've talked about these different epics. And now we've talked about some of the remedies. Mm -hmm. um, we also talked a little bit about the biographical work that an anthroposophic medicine doc, um, you know, might perform. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to give people sort of an idea as to how this might all be synthesized together. And when I, after training week, I kind of got heavy into the, the sort of um, the remedies, so to speak, for mm -hmm. autoimmune conditions. And what I learned was that at some point during these early epics, and the epics again are seven years, so roughly zero, you know, birth to seven, seven to 14, seven, you know, 14 to 21. And you notice that like, you get your your second set of teeth around age seven. You know, I mean, their sexual maturity around age fourteen, coming of age mm -hmm. twenty one, and then you hit your freedom. That's where that personal responsibility piece really starts to stick. Maybe not until age twenty eight. And of course, we have ideas as to how the frontal cortex forms, and we make more responsible decisions into our twenties, etc. But let's say that something happens during this what they call individuation process. Mm -hmm. whereby you're becoming imbued and there's this beautiful orchestration between the physical, the etheric, the astral, and the eye, um, these four, this fourfold model that you presented earlier. 
if something uh, from what I've read, and I don't, I'm not prescribing these remedies yet because I don't understand the process, and I like to really understand why. However, in reading about autoimmune diseases seen through the anthroposophic lens and the big old fat textbook that I have now to accompany my studies, right. it's usually a matter of reinforcing the integration of the eye in these autoimmune processes through something like phosphorus, mistletoe, or even quartz. Can you maybe try to break down what I just said? Um, because I know what I read, but I want people to understand how you as a physician might help to, um, without really being able to know the patient entirely, mm -hmm. maybe you can help them understand why those remedies are necessarily beneficial for something that happened way long ago that you're actually mm -hmm. experiencing painfully or otherwise now. This is the final, the final part of our interview, I promise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to do another part. Um, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> That would be fun to do. So if someone has an autoimmune illness, going through these four levels, we could say on a physical testing level, yes, we check a SED rate, we check a CRP, um, we're looking for other markers, you know, is this lupus, is this rheumatoid arthritis? Those are very helpful. Yeah, what are the antibodies directed you... towards our healthy Absolutely. tissues. Yeah. yeah, those markers are very helpful. You need that information. I guess a second level in terms of time can be to say, gosh, this person is reacting in a way that probably stems from some kind of immune intention to really defend the body or some confusion. Mm. And so how could we help somebody really release something that's caused irritation? Let's say somebody has... Um, the development of an autoimmune illness after some kind of exposure or they're developing it in a postpartum period where there's been shifts in immune system activity or somebody develops chronic hives that's more allergic. But, but, but there are these places where you could say, well, what's happened as a stimulus that the immune system is, is being irritated? And how can I help the body release that? So there, there are different kinds of ways to support the liver and the kidneys to say, let's really clear out substance that might be bothering you. So the second level is helping someone looking at time and release. A third level can be to say, there's inflammation happening, which is really not consciously guided fully. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that happens because there's a chronic irritation. Like, let's say the association between gluten sensitivity or celiac disease and then an autoimmune thyroiditis, where the immune system is constantly being irritated, constantly being challenged. And in that process, it gets a little bit misguided so that it's reacting, but without full intention. And so trying to see, well, what's the pattern that's happening here over and over again? And how can we understand and re-guide that pattern? And then a final aspect can be, or maybe it's the first aspect, is to say, how can we really help someone strengthen to know what is their intention? How do we help strengthen their eye? Because some of the medicines that you mentioned in terms of phosphorus or quartz, these are very important things therapeutically, that can help us feel really who we are and where our boundary is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are relationships between autoimmune illnesses and shocks or trauma or something happened, and we weren't really able to be self-defining after that point. Or yeah. we've been so busy pleasing and taking care of other people that we've lost our own ability to self-define and self-care. So th this aspect of treating the eye with th these, these strengthening remedies is really trying to say, let's also help support the person who's guiding the ship. And uh, that's important for future as well. Because what's happening is inflammation at the moment, that may be 
something that's washed downstream from experiences or imbalances of last week or last month or a decade ago? And how do we change course so that it's really going to be different in future? Wow. Well, there's a lot more, of course, to unpack with that. And uh, but I, you know, if you're listening out there and this is all new to you, you can understand that there's quite a bit of difference between what Adam, what you just said, and the um, quick diagnosis, take this pill or have this surgery approach, which may be helpful for a lot of people, but is it really getting at what what happened across the whole journey that brought you here into my office that may be contributing to this, which you could call it as root cause, you could call it root cause or whatever else, but it, it's actually even it's actually even broader than that. And I that's what I I love so much about what what I'm learning to do with your help. And um, I think that if we can as a as a society, if we can start to wrap our heads around the, the, the possibility that hey, maybe we've reached the limits, so to speak, of what the strictly allopathic model, the fast medicine model, is able to offer us. If we could take a step back and just be willing to say, hey, let's let's keep this, let's integrate it into a, a more whole person approach, could we see better results? We certainly don't have anything to lose. And um, I think everybody, you probably have a very busy practice because you have such a, uh, you're so, um, I don't want to say good bedside manner because it's so cliche, but you have like this warmth about you where, where in order to, to be able to share some of these vulnerable things, maybe it's past traumas, whatever else, I think it also is reflected in just how you show up as a teacher is you're so warm and you just seem like you're safe to share these things with and and I think that that's also lacking in the fast medical model where you get to see your doc for, I remember reading a British medical journal study that showed that in the average primary care visit um, that a patient gets 22 seconds to speak before their doctor jumps in and starts <laughs> to diagnose and treat their, their issue, you know? Right. Um, and so what you're describing takes a lot of time, but I think it also would be very ther therapeutic for us as, as physicians to be able to really get to know a person better before we start trying to implement tools. So I said a lot there. All of it is to say thank you for, for showing up in the way that you do and for spending time with me today. Um, is there any final thoughts or do you want to maybe direct people towards Pam in order to, you know, maybe there's somebody out there that sure. wants to join us next year for training week or otherwise? Absolutely. Well, the, the training conference that Nathan described, it's happening early May. It'll be in Colorado this year. It's moving around a little bit. And a mentor told me, if you want to find water, don't dig a bunch of holes, dig one deep hole. <laughs> and uh, we, we can't do that every day. We can't do that all the time. Prednisone is still really important for autoimmune illness at different times, but there are so many more options and viewpoints for it. Yeah. And you get to the place where you say, there's got to be more than just another course of prednisone. Yeah. Um, and I think when, when you're exploring these broader aspects of medicine, it doesn't mean that you have to change everything that you're doing. It can just be saying, there are some times with some patients that I would like to dig deeper. And I'd like to have some guidance and community to be able to explore that because it has huge meaning for the people um, who can do that. And, and I really think as a practitioner, it brings great meaning. And I started by saying, I think anthroposophic medicine is actually very an opt a very optimistic medicine because I think you see these processes of development and change and say, what I'm doing has meaning. I love doing this, so. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Um, where can people go? I mean, where, where would you like them to go either to reach out to you with questions yeah. or to uh, maybe even join us? I, I'd be fun to meet somebody Absolutely. who's a listener of the show. Maybe I'll be so, the, uh, uh, the vanguard here for the OBGYN <laughs> community too. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. Um, you can go to the website, which is Anthroposophic Medicine. That's A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-S-O-P-H-I-C medicine. There's also a, an international website, which is Anthromedics, which has a lot of good introductory material. Um, start there. Those are good places. 
and happy to answer any questions and would love to see people at the training course next year or some of the webinars and things that we do during the rest of the year as well. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. I'll see you, you actually tomorrow night for class. We'll keep studying. Absolutely. <laughs>